My name's John Parkinson. Uh, I'm from the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. And um, what I'm going to be presenting today is uh, kind of an analysis of uh, metatranscriptomics, what we're doing with metatranscriptomics, what metatranscriptomics is, and perhaps why some of you guys might want to consider metatranscriptomics for your analyses. Anyway, I hope by the end of this talk, you'll have a, maybe a bit more of an appreciation as to why you might want to consider metatranscriptomics. All right, so I just want to, again, mention this talk's come by Creative Commons, so it's going to be available online, and uh, feel free to use the presentation as you see fit, and slides, and so forth. Um, yeah, so just going over the what the objectives of this kind of module is. So this is going to be a presentation, uh, hopefully not more than an hour, and then we'll, um, we'll hear from Jacques, and then... Um, and then uh, we'll have a practical for about an hour going through some of the pipelines that uh, we've been using for analyzing metatranscriptomic data. Uh, so again, I think the idea here is to really get you understanding what metatranscriptomics can do, gain an appreciation of perhaps some of the challenges in the sample collection and experimental design. Uh, but the main focus is going to be on perhaps the, uh, the um, steps in data processing. And then the tutorial is really based around uh, being able to simply relatively simple metatranscriptomic data set. It's only 100,000 reads. Normally, when we're analyzing these data sets, there's, again, uh, hundreds of millions of reads. To do. So an overview for the presentation. What is metatranscriptomic? How does it relate to RNA-seq? Uh, brief bit on experimental design, software preparation, and so forth. Uh, but the main... Main focus is going to be on the processing of the reads, but on the statistical analysis of visualization. All right, so why should we consider metatranscriptomics in our analyses? So, as Morgan very eloquently uh, outlined uh, yesterday, some of the differences between the different technologies that we're applying to study microbiomes, we have 16S surveys. These are very informative, they tell us who is there, but it doesn't really give us much in the way of mechanistic insights. Um, and this is a study from a colleague of ours at UC Denver from about 2007-2008. Uh, this is a study of uh, patients with IBD, um, uh, healthy individuals, looking at different um, taxonomic groups on the intestine. And so you can see that there's huge differences between IBD patients but, and uh, healthy patients, but you have no idea if that's cause or consequence. This is a study that uh, Morgan highlighted yesterday. This is, uh, this is a metagenomic survey. Again, just to outline, at the top here we have different uh, individuals showing huge variation in their phyla across different body sites. However, when you look at the functions, the functions look relatively similar. So the, su the suggestion here is that different uh, groups of, uh, or, or different taxonomic groups um, in your microbiome can actually result in the same function. So maybe we don't care so much about what organisms are there, maybe we're more interested in what they're doing. And so this is what metatranscriptomics is attempting to do. It's really trying to identify who is doing what within your microbiome. All right. So how do we, how do we go about doing this? The whole idea between metatranscriptomics is that we're exploiting this RNA-seq technology, really to determine which genes, which pathways are actually being actively expressed within a community. Okay, so for example, we might have a set of genes here that are involved in cell wall biogenesis. By using metatranscriptomics, we might use um, these nodes in this graph, for example, which these nodes represent a gene. The size of these genes might represent the relative expression of these genes. And so you can see within a particular sample which genes are actually active. And then by layering on taxonomic information, you might be able to identify which particular taxonomic groups are responsible for those particular activities. Okay, so I want to go over briefly one vignette um, that um, we've been working on recently. And this is a study looking at a gene called perilipin 2. So perilipin 2 is, uh, in this case, it's a mouse gene, or PLIN2, uh, and it's involved in lipid uptake in the gut. And previous studies have shown that a knockout of PLIN2 can actually modulate to microbiome structure. And so we were interested in understanding, if you do the knockout, what impact does it have on microbiome function? So what we did, we designed an experiment. We had uh, four mice in each group. There are four groups. 
Um, we have a pin to knockout, we have wild type, and we're exposing these different mice to two different diets, so a high fat diet and a low fat diet. And when we look at the taxonomic groups that we recover under each of these um, diets, so what we've done is we've, uh, we've, we've taken sequel contents and then we've uh, subjected these to metatranscriptomics. Uh, we generate about 20 to 30 million reads per sample. And then we've used these metatranscriptomic reads, so we're not using 16S data here to actually look at the abundances. We're actually looking at the messenger RNAs to determine the taxonomic contributions within each of these samples. When we do the statistical comparisons across these samples, we find that diet has a significant effect, and you can see changes and shifts in microbiota associated with diet, as we might expect. However, when we look at the PLIN2 high fats, the wild type high fats, these two mice, so two different genotypes fed the same diet, the actual taxonomic abundances looks very similar. Okay, so under a high fat diet, the PLIN2 knockout mice exhibit a similar microbiome to the wild type. Okay, so this is kind of the reverse of what we found in that metagenomic study where you found that different, um, different um, individuals can exhibit huge diversity in terms of their micro microbiomes. Here we've got two different genotypes of mice, and they're actually having very similar microbiomes in terms of their structure. Okay, so what about function? So under, a high, under both low-fat and a high-fat diet, clean to and wild-type mice exhibit this genotype-specific dif differential expression of highly expressed genes. Okay, so when, when we're doing the mapping, and I'll explain how we do the mapping of all of these metatranscriptomic data sets, we found we were able to map all of our reads to around about 57,000 transcripts. And across all these transcripts, we found that around about 73% of them are shared across all four of these samples. When we look at these highly expressed transcripts, however, so these are ones with this RPKM, this is reads per um, um, thousand reads mapped. Uh, this is a way of normalizing expression uh, across um, different metatranscriptome or different RNA-seq data sets. We find that each of these different samples exhibits the expression of uh, their own sets of genes. Okay? And so again, when we do the statistical analysis, we find that there's about 1,300 genes which exhibit differential expression across these different sample types. Okay, so what we can do is we can subject these uh, differentially expressed transcripts, these 1,300 differentially ex expressed transcripts, and we can do gene set enrichment analysis or pathway enrichment analysis, and we identified 22 out of 180 metabolic pathways were enriched for these differentially expressed transcripts between the PLIN2 and wild type mice that are fed a high fat diet. So remember, these are two mice, two groups of mice that were fed the same diet didn't exhibit any differences in their taxonomic composition, but when we look at the functions, they're actually expressing different pathways. And the idea here is that the PLIN2 knockout, what's causing um, this to happen in the mouse is that you're getting an accumulation of the triglycerides in the gut, and then that's somehow impacting these metabolic pathways. A lot of them are associated with uh, amino acid biosynthesis, energy metabolism, and it's causing changes, redirections in the flux of the pathways uh, to account for this additional uh, quantity of triglycerides in the gut. All right, so again, this is just a vignette again to show you why we think it's important to consider metatranscriptomics. So these kind of functional differences you wouldn't have observed using just 16S analyses. All right, so how do we go about doing metatranscriptomics? So the basic process is through this um, technology, RNA-seq, which has been around a number of years now. RNA-seq, it's the unbiased sequencing of an RNA sample uh, to really, unlike microarrays, um, yield a digital readout of the relative expression of transcripts in the sample. So here we have a mouse, we extract the RNA, uh, we then fragment all these RNAs, we sequence it, we then align these reads to known transcripts to get a readout of the relative expression. Now typically, RNA-seq is applied to organisms where you have a reference genome, so this mapping exercise is really easy. However, as we know, microbiomes are a lot more complex, and so microbiome applications really face a number of additional challenges that traditional RNA-seq methods don't have. Are there any questions on this first part of the talk so far? Yes? Can you go into it, but how do you enrich the, the RNA um, when you look at um, the extracted from samples that you have a lot of? Excellent point. So, um, 
in the, I'll, I'll cover this in the next couple of slides. So in a typical RNA-seq experiment, you apply it to a eukaryotic organism. You can enrich for the messenger RNA because they have these poly-A tails. Bacteria don't have these poly-A tails. And as a consequence, ribosomal RNAs tend to be in significantly larger abundances in messenger RNA. So this is a huge problem. In addition, as you've suggested, if you have host contamination as well, then this is also an issue. So we did a stool sample from an IBD patient a couple of years ago. We found that around about 95% of the sequence reads were human-derived, uh, and 95% are actually coming from bacteria. So host can, contamination can be a significant problem. Um, the other issue that we're facing is that environmental samples really lack reference genomes. So this makes it incredibly challenging to map reads back to their source transcripts. John, I think in, in the, for the libraries as well, you have now uh, tools like for Illumina sequencing where you can remove uh, you know, uh, polymer in, you know, RNA. Next slide. Thanks for that, though. That, uh, oh, sorry, the slide after this one. I beg your pardon. Uh, all right, so this is what a typical metatranscriptomic analytical pipe, pipeline might look like. Pretty similar to a metagenomics pipeline. So here we have our mouse, obtain the RNA, prepare it for sequencing. So this is a step that uh, Jacques was alluding to, where we might want to enrich for certain um, moieties for messenger RNAs. Generate the reads, remove low quality, so you have some pure reads and you started off with here. Remove the ribosomal RNAs, you have even fewer reads, remove host reads. Hopefully you've got something left at the end here. And then you can assemble, identify the bacterial transcripts that they originate from by doing this mapping. And then once you've got these transcripts, start mapping into these pathways to actually understand what kind of biological systems are actually being upregulated or differentially regulated in your particular samples. All right, so one of the problems with this sample uh, collection, RNA extraction, is that RNA, unlike DNA, deteriorates rapidly. Okay, so the method of storage preparation can really impact how much you can recover and even which taxa you can recover. And um, given that there's only three of you who are actually doing any uh, metatranscriptomic work at the moment-ish, perhaps, um, it's probably not surprising that the methods for actually extracting and processing and storing um, uh, microbiome samples for RNA extraction really hasn't been standardized yet. So that's still going to be a work in progress. So we found that the best, obviously the best is going to process immediately and ideally to sequence, but at least if you can extract and purify the RNA, then if you can store it at minus 80, then it tends to be relatively stable. Next best is to snap freeze in liquid nitrogen and store at minus 80 again. But again, the longer you store it, then you do start seeing deterioration in the quality of the RNA. We would suggest, uh, I know some people are interested in using RNA later, we, have, we, we suggest avoiding the use of RNA later to, um, to maintain the integrity of the samples. As we find that it can lie some cells, it can interfere with some of the RNA extraction kits that we use. And so, in general, we don't tend to use these RNA later kits. Uh, Metatranscriptomics, it's not cheap. So, um, I think it was mentioned yesterday that we're down to about $30 a sample for 16S. Here we're talking around about $300 to $400 a sample. The cost isn't necessarily the sequencing, the cost is actually in the library preparation. Okay, so the kits that you have to use in order to generate um, the sequence libraries, these tend to be quite expensive. So this raises some interesting questions as to how many biological replicates do you need? Suggest maybe at least two. I think we're trying to do at least four in most of our analyses at the moment. Again, these can be very challenging, especially if we're considering human samples where some of these, um, our ability to get these biological replicates is, is really limited. And um, again, power analyses also are, are incredibly challenging. So I think uh, Rob alluded to a paper yesterday which was looking at power analyses in 16S data sets, and that was published in 2016. We haven't really got very far at all in terms of understanding how do we do power analyses for metatranscriptomics. So these are some of the challenges that we're facing with metatranscriptomics at the moment. Okay, so on to the sample preparation. So 
as I mentioned, bacterial messenger RNA is a lack of poly A tail. And generally, ribosomal RNA uh, species tend to be highly abundant. So they would generally represent 95 to 99% of all of your RNA sequences. So there's a number of kits now that are available to remove uh, some of these abundant ribosomal RNA species. And they seem to be improving over time. Um, so the one that we're recommending this is Ribo Zero Gold Kit. This is available from Illumina. This is their data, so they're claiming huge amounts of success in terms of how much they can deplete. Um, we originally started with a Ribo Minus Kit in 2012, and I think we recovered about 25% of the reads were actually messenger RNA, and about 75% was ribosomal RNA. So it reduced it a bit, not much. And then a couple of years later, we we tried this Ribo Zero kit, so I think it was the first generation. We're able to increase that to about 50% messenger RNAs and 50% ribosomal RNA. The latest ones, so that data that I showed you right at the beginning uh, from these uh, 16 different mice, uh, there we ended up with about 70 or 80% messenger RNAs. So it seems that the kits are improving and they're doing a pretty good job of removing these uh, abundant ribosomal RNA species. And then, as we mentioned, also host messenger RNAs can also prove challenging. At the same time, you could spin this around and think, actually, this is going to give us information on what the host is actually expressing. So there's a potential there when you're analyzing your data sets that perhaps you could be analyzing these host uh, mRNAs to see what the host is actually doing in response to your microbiome. All right, generating reads. How many reads do we need to generate? How much is enough? So this is from an analysis we did um, a couple of years ago where we took four of these published uh, metatranscriptomic data sets. We did a rare fraction analysis, and we counted the number of enzymes. Okay, Not the number of transcripts, but the number of enzymes that are associated with our sample. So to give you the idea that perhaps we're not so much interested in the specific transcripts or the specific organism that these transcripts are coming from, maybe it's a function that they're contributing. So we can do these rare affection analyses, just look at these different functions, in this case, uh, enzyme classifications. And we see we kind of saturate around about 5, 000, uh, 5 million or so reads. And so we're thinking, given um, loss of reads as you've been generated through the various sequencing pipelines, maybe about um, 20 million reads per uh, sample is sufficient. So that's our current recommendation. Again, that might um, go up as we learn more and more about some of the problems with the statistics of um, analyzing metatranscriptomic data sets. How do we analyze the data? So metatranscriptomics, very much in its infancy, relatively new field, relatively few robust software standards and methods that are out there, so these still need to be developed. Uh, and new tools are continuously being created. So the concept here is that we can have some kind of pipeline, but it should be relatively modular so that you can swap in and out different pieces, different pieces of software as they show continuing improvement. So this is our pipeline from a couple of years ago. We take the raw reads. There's a pre-processing step. So this means we take um, the raw sequence reads. We get rid of the low quality, get rid of the ribosomal RNAs, get rid of the host transcripts, adapters, and so forth. So there's a pre-processing step, there's then an assembly and an annotation step to tell us what these reads actually are. Uh, so there's new assembly methods that are coming out, new annotation methods that are coming out. And then finally we have some kind of groups of analyses that we might want to do. And again, these analysis methods are also going to be changing. So a lot of these methods, particularly around processing at the top, these can use a lot of these existing tools that are being applied to um, analyzing any kind of uh, high throughput sequencing technology. These are a couple of pipelines that have been published recently, uh, last year in fact, so SAMHSA. Um, again, there's a pre-processing step, there's an annotation step. They don't actually do an assembly step. And then there's, they aggregate some of the results from the annotation and then there's kind of an analysis step afterwards. Uh, there's this one called IMP. Uh, this is interesting because it combines metagenomics with metatranscriptomics. So the idea here is rather than doing metatranscriptomics in isolation, you actually do metagenomics at the same time, create a whole bunch of contigs as an assembly, and you can use those to then map your metatranscript reads onto. So it might make it easier to do the annotation downstream. 
So again, they have a pre-processing step, they have an assembly step, and then they have some kind of annotation and analysis steps. So these are the kind of frameworks that we're working with for developing these pipelines. So how do we do the reprocessing? So the idea is that we want to, from our, all the reads that we generated from uh, our sequencing machine, we want to identify those reads that are derived from messenger RNAs. Um, and so there's a number of contaminations that you get. So you get low quality data, you get adapters that you need to trim off, you have host uh, data that also needs to be removed from ribosomal RNA. So these have already been covered to some extent uh, when we're analyzing the metagenomics uh, data sets, so I won't go over those. Just one thing to point out, this infernal process to identify and remove the ribosomal RNAs, this is a real pain because this is probably the rate limiting step. Unfortunately, we haven't found a tool yet which is able to have the same sensitivity as infernal, but it's a very slow step. So, whereas a lot of these steps could be run on um, a relatively modest um, workstation, we find that this infernal step is so slow that you really do need to think about um, putting your analyses onto a supercomputer. Um, once we have removed all of these contaminants and we're left with what we think are putative messenger RNAs, we then do an assembly step. And the reason we do an assembly step is we found that assembly improves annotation accuracy. If you can assemble these relatively short reads into longer contexts, your ability to annotate them rises quite dramatically. And so this is why we're proposing that you do an assembly step. Um, we looked at a number of different assemblers uh, a few years ago. We found that Trinity gave us the best performance, the highest proportion of reads that could be annotated. However, new tools are coming out all the time, as I suggested, and we've now swapped Trinity with uh, spades. Okay. So again, just remember when you're developing these pipelines, if you are developing these pipelines, to think in terms of modular design. So you can always swap in better performing algorithms as they're developed. One issue that could arise that we haven't had too much um, issues with are, are chimeras. So these are misassembled contigs, and these can be uh, particularly problematic where reads are driving from autologs from different species. We haven't actually found this to be too significant a problem in metatranscriptomics. We find that re anything from about 1 to 3 percent of our contigs might represent some kind of chimera. So it's relatively low. And then there are tools such as uchime that you might be able to apply to actually identify and correct some of these chimeras. Okay, so we've got our assembled contigs. We've also got our unassembled reads that we couldn't assign into contigs. How do we annotate these? How do we ascribe some kind of functional annotation associated with what can be relatively short reads? So um, this is a little bit depressing that uh, despite the fact that BLAST was created in about 1990 or so, we're still reliant on BLAST or BLAST-like tools, sequence similarity tools, for doing this annotation. Okay. Um, we do adopt tools such as BWA and BLAT. Uh, these are relatively fast. Um, however, the problem with these tools is that they rely on near-perfect matches. And as we know, you can get, particularly in environmental samples, a lot of diversity, particularly at the nucleotide level, which means that you just can't get these sequence-based matches. The other problem that we find is that even when we're sequencing from a different strain from a, from a species that may be well characterized, we can identify a whole set of new genes that we haven't seen before. So this is a nice study from 2007, 2008, uh, which was looking at the genes associated with streptococcus, various strains of streptococcus agalacti, and what they did on these rarefaction plots, and they find that as you sequence uh, additional genomes of streptococcus agalacti, you get additional new genes that you haven't discovered before. And as we know, this is a common um, element pretty much for any species that are out, out there. So this is this pan-genome uh, concept where each of these different species are sampling from different portions of this global pan-genome. And so we may not, when we're using these kinds of tools and we're trying to do sequence sanity searches against reference databases, we just might not have all the genes associated with this pan-genome. Um, so one solution to get around this idea of all this nucleotide diversity that you, you see at the strain level 
is to move in peptide space and to use these blast x like searches against protein databases. Um, so we've been using BLAST up to about two years ago. It's slow, it's time consuming, but fortunately now we have Diamond. It does pretty much a similar job to BLAST. I think uh, when we did benchmarking, around about 95% of the hits that we got in Diamond were exactly the same as BLAST. So it's basically doing a similar job to um, BLAST. But it's much, much faster. I think, uh, did somebody mention it was about 40 times faster or 100 times faster than BLAST? So much, much faster. However, even with these BLAST X like searches, we still get large proportions of reads that are unannotated. So these are five different sets of metatranscriptomes. Uh, this blue, this depressingly large blue bar here, are uh, the proportion of reads that could not be mapped by either BLAST, BLAT, or BWA. Now we're hoping that as sequencing platforms deliver longer and longer read lengths, that these kinds of issues might start going away. But again, annotation, identifying a match within our data sets can remain problematic. All right, so are there any questions so far on this first part of the talk? Okay, great. So this is a tiered set of searches. So we use BWA and BLAT against a, uh, it was a set of about 2,000 microbial genomes. And then BLAST was uh, performed against uh, the uh, protein NR database. OK, so we're hugely reliant on BLAST because BWA and BLAT really rely on these almost exact matches, which is great if you have those reference genomes already sequenced and they're part of your metatranscriptome data set. But we don't. So we are really reliant on these BLAST X matches. So this is a typical match for a 71 base pair read. We're now up to about 100 or 150 bases as a standard for doing metatranscriptomics. But this is a typical BLAST report. We get an E value of 39. So it's not E to the minus 39, it's actually 39. Okay, so this really wouldn't be considered a statistically significant match. But when we look at the species, that looks about right. And so when we look at the summary for all the matches, we do find that there's a large proportion where uh, a lot of their reads match at very high identity um, across the length of the particular match. And so rather than using these e-values, we prefer to use cutoffs based on read lengths as well as a percentage identity of match. Okay, any questions on that? All right. So again, I've mentioned that from that metagenomic study, maybe we're not so interested in knowing which particular file or which particular transcripts might be present in a particular microbiome. Maybe we're just interested in the function. So the way that we're thinking about uh, this annotation strategy is first of all to map to a known transcript, but then, because that transcript could be a spurious match, we know that there could be about 10 different blast matches that might map your sequence read, you're just taking the top one. But what we do is we map the known transcript to a more general function, so it could be an enzyme. So the idea here is that even if your sequence read could be matched to 10 different um, transcripts with uh, the same probability, each one of those transcripts is likely to have the same function, so it could be the same enzyme function. And so because we're not particularly interested in the specific transcripts, we're more interested in the specific enzyme function, then we do this mapping. So we map initially to a known transcript, and then we use that transcript to map to the more general function. So these bar graphs here represent um, basically the number of reads sequenced for 16 different samples, the putative messenger RNAs associated with these reads that were sequenced, and there's a high correlation between these two. Unique transcripts associated with each of these. So this is <coughs> relatively invariant. There seems to be a problem with this particular sample here. However, when we map to the unique enzymes, then we get a much more um, standardized kind of sample. So you can eliminate a lot of the variation if you start mapping into these more general functional categories. All right. Um, so one thing that we have with these uh, messenger RNAs uh, and these tags is um, an ability to measure the relative expression of these transcripts of these enzymes within our particular sample, but it has to be normalized to some extent. 
So we need to account for differences in gene length. Um, so longer genes are likely to give you um, more reads just because they're longer. So by random sampling, you're more likely to sample from a longer read. And so you have this reads per kilobase of transcripts mapped. So this is a kind of a transformation where you convert your raw read counts based on the length of the particular sequence into these RPKM values. And there's a, a bit of a calculation behind it. Okay, so this is a way that you can normalize, standardize the expression based on the length of the actual transcript. And there's uh, several software tools that are now available to do this mapping, calculate these normalized expression profiles, and this is a fairly standard part of these pipelines now. Uh, something to be aware of, though, is that you do need to normalize uh, your read counts into some kind of expression value to account for the fact that you can have relatively long reads. Okay, so that covered... Yes. So on I'm sorry. So you have so you just normalize to the read length. Yes. But not in gene expression, you normalize to the housekeeping gene. So doesn't that concept just apply? Yeah. Yes, and we're looking into that. That's a, that's a great idea. That hasn't been put into any of these pipelines yet, but yes, that's certainly uh, a direction that's been explored at the moment is which housekeeping gene should we be focusing in in order to uh, look at the relative abundance within these samples. Yeah, great point. Okay, so that's, yes? So, uh, in, in some ways, uh, I mean, if you take uh, the CEC, you know, the Enzyme Commission, some of those are usually well conserved in some ways, you know, in metabolomic pathways. Those could possibly be uh, housekeeping genes that would have to be there in, in a bacteria. Or so. Absolutely. Uh, I think there was a paper that came out last year which predicted, I think, 20 or so housekeeping genes based on uh, analysis, genome analyses across all these different bacteria, and they came up with this, or it might have been, might have been 102 in that ballpark figure. And then you could use those potentially. These would include things like uh, a lot of ribosomal proteins and uh, gyrases and so forth. Um, so, so we are starting to look at some of those genes and the ability to normalize based on some of those genes. Yeah. Yes? Okay, um, maybe you explained this, but I, I might have missed it. Um, so when you're extracting RNA, there's a lot of bacteria present. And there's possibility of homologs, homolog genes. How do you like differentiate at the end which bacteria this came from? So this is, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be talking about in this next part. So, so how do we actually understand, out of all these functions, who's actually contributing to these right. functions? So I'll be, I'll be discussing that in the next part, the taxonomic architecture part. Thanks. Yes? Yeah, follow up on the housekeeping gene thing. Uh, I don't do much transcriptomic work right now, but my master's project is actually measuring gene expression by real-time PCR, and I did use a housekeeping gene at the time. And, and using housekeeping genes was seen much more of a pro as a problem more than a, than a plus size. So, so why would you be interested in using housekeeping genes to normalize the data? So um, one, of, one of the big problems with a lot of these, uh, whether it's you're doing 16S analyses or metagenomics or even RNA-seq data, is that you're just getting count data out rather than the absolute quantification. And so if you are wanting to start addressing the ability to quantify within your sample what the levels are, rather than doing more of the relative levels, then you need to start thinking about looking at, given that these housekeeping genes should be relatively stable across these particular taxa, are these changes I'm seeing in these particular pathways, are these real or not, given that this is this is what we're expecting the copy number of this particular gene to be. Suddenly our metabolic pathway has gone sky high. Is that real or not? Or are all of the housekeeping genes associated with that particular organism, with that particular pathway, also um, in increasing at that amount? So it's a way of trying to get at this way of uh, normalizing across uh, different cells. 
What's that? Yeah. Yeah. It's also connected to the whole housekeeping gene thing. With respect to the problem with metabolic genes is that <clears throat> microbiome responds to food a lot, and a lot of conditions it becomes a question of why rewiring the metabolism and the energy consumption <laughs> or production. So actually metabolic genes may end up being one of the most very variable genes across the different genes that are available. So maybe something more like a DNA synthesis type of gene, that's because you know, they need to replicate, they need to divide and grow. Um, but yeah, there's a, it's just a caution towards yeah. metabolic genes. Absolutely. And it would depend on the actual type of metabolic enzymes. And I imagine that certain metabolic enzymes are going to be less prone to that than others as well. Which again, it's going to be related with uh, active kinetics. So if an enzyme is working very fast anyway, it needs to be up to in response to a particular condition because it's really not the bottom neck in that particular pathway. So these kinds of, which of these 120 or so genes that have been found widely conserved across all these bacteria, which of these might actually represent a group of more vertical samples that we still have to start with? Okay. So going back to the original question on taxonomic annotation, so we've assigned, hopefully, uh, uh, RNA reads to different functions. But we might want to know which taxa are actually responsible for these functions so that we can identify the keystone taxa. Um, another idea is that can also help with binning for assembly. So this is something I haven't really mentioned. I'm not going to go into because uh, I don't think it's widely applied for many transcriptomics yet, but the idea is that you might want to take your sequence reads, bin them into different taxonomic groups, and then assemble them once you've done the binning. Okay, so processes such as taxonomic annotation of your reads could help with that binning step prior to the uh, assembly. Um, so we could use things like alignment-based methods such as BLAST and BWA. Um, but we know that these can fail where we lack suitable reference genomes. They don't tend to be very accurate. And so there's been a lot more interest in compositional methods. So these are based on uh, KMA frequencies. So here we might have a set of KMAs. We might have a profile associated with these KMAs. And then we can use methods such as nearest neighbors, perhaps, to actually assign a sequence to the genome with which it shares the closest distribution of its KMAs. So there's a number of tools that use these kinds of approaches. So there's Clark, there's NBC is probably the most successful one at the moment. Um, it's a little bit clunky, but um, I don't think that there's a software, piece of software that's actually been shown to outperform NBC at the moment. It's very slow though. And then there's Kraken, which was mentioned yesterday. Uh, there's a couple more that we have been looking at recently uh, that were just published last year. One is Keiju. Uh, and this is one that um, we'll be using in the, um, in the tutorial. So Keiju um, is um, relatively fast. So it's working, rather than at the nucleotide level, it's working at the protein level. And it uses this virus reader transform. So what it's doing, it does a six-fold translation of your sequence read. And, the, and these bits here might represent uh, stop codons. And then it sorts these. Uh, frames um, into these by length, and then it tries to find these maximum uh, matches to known sequences across going in descending order to find what is the largest match I can get. And then it assigns to read to this taxon with the largest match. So because it's working at the protein level, it can account for sequencing errors or, or subtle nucleotide differences. Um, the problem with KJ, it has relatively large memory requirements is a bit of an issue, so I think this might require something like a 100 gigabyte machine to run. Um, on the plus side, it does have a really nice GUI at the end, which you'll see in the tutorial, which enables you to explore the taxonomic distribution of your data set. Um, so that's, that's one that we've started exploring. Another one is Centrifuge. This was also published uh, late last year. So this again uses the Sparrow Reader's Transform. Again, it's very fast. Um, it can account for sequencing errors, and it improves over the existing KMA. So um, Kraken was, I think, the uh, precursor to Centrifuge. Kraken requires up to about 100 gigs. <coughs> this uh, Centrifuge requires much less memory, and the reason it's able to use much less memory is that it has this kind of cool compression algorithm. So what it does, it takes genomes from the same species, 
and it compares them, and then it identifies where two genomes might be exactly the same, and it just takes out the new bits of the genome and it adds it to the database, compares it to the next genome, finds what the differences are between this genome and this combination of genomes, and adds them in and so forth. So this can really significantly compress your database. You end up with a smaller database to compare against. And as a consequence of that, you don't need as much memory to actually run these searches. So I think we can use cent centrifuges that have been used, I think, on a 8 uh, gig RAM machine. So this is actually possible um, for us to do on desktops. The other interesting feature it does is it assigns reads to multiple taxa so that it doesn't say there's one best hit. It will say that, well, it could be any of these different things down here. And you could force it to take the top hit. Um, or you can report uh, what the different distributions are. So again, this is an interesting feature that you may or may not want to use. In terms of performance, so I could show you the performance from their particular papers on their particular data sets. And this seems to be an interesting thing that whenever somebody produces a new software tool and they end up benchmarking it, it always does better than their competitors, potentially because they've used their own data set. So we've not, so, I, so I'm not showing what their kind of benchmarking is from their papers here. I'm showing against one of our mouse uh, gut microbiomes. Diamond is our standard tool here. Uh, so this is a breakdown of taxa from these metatranscriptomic reads according to Diamond. This is Keiju, and this is Centrifuge. So we see that Keiju and Diamond are pretty similar. And that's perhaps not so surprising because Keiju is, in effect, a, doing a BlastX type algorithm. It's turning stuff into peptide space and then it's doing comparisons at the protein level, which is what we're using Diamond for. Centrifuge, on the other hand, gives you quite different results. So we've got a set of reads down here, uh, which are, I think, Firmicutes, and these are greatly reduced relative to these other two tools. When we look at the percent reads annotated, we see that Centrifuge does a much poorer job of being able to annotate reads rather than Keiju, which itself is not as good as Diamond. So potentially the reason why we see fewer reads being annotated to Fermicutes here is because it's not able to annotate some of these reads up here. Okay? So this could be a problem with centrifuges that it's biased towards identifying certain taxonomic groups. So we're still exploring again how best do we start exploring and integrating some of these tools to give us a more robust platform for taxonomic annotation associated with their metatranscriptome data sets. Any questions on Taxonomic annotations. Good. Just one thing to bear in mind, when we're trying to compare the taxonomic annotations that we get out from metatranscriptomic data, it doesn't correlate necessarily with the taxonomic annotations with the 16S data. And that perhaps shouldn't be so surprising. First of all, you could get artifacts due to biases in the ribosomal RNA or the mRNA sequencing processing steps. So that's obviously going to confound a uh, comparison between. So here we've got messenger RNA, ribosomal RNA, messenger RNA, ribosomal RNA. So these are different pairs. What's happened here? So those were different, those were different pairs of samples that were being analyzed. And pretty much across the board, all of the messenger RNA profiles look very similar to each other and very distinct from the ribosome and RNA profiles. Okay. Yes? So uh, there's a, a certain amount of percentage of reads that are not annotated, but what tells you that it's, which one is the best one because it can have annotated, but it's a, a wrong annotation. So how do you know which one is good uh, with your read annotation when you compare uh, some tissues with K2 and uh, BLAST? So, there's a number of simulated data sets that you can produce, and that's what they do their benchmarking on. So they create these simulated data sets, and then they compare how well they do for these simulated data sets. We actually had a mouse data set where we think we know what this taxa actually are. So this was a mouse metatranscriptome. It was inoculated with something called outer Shedler's flora, which is supposed to contain about eight or ten different taxa. And we can use that, and the genomes just got published, I think, about two two to three years ago, so we can use that as a kind of a gold standard in a real metatranscriptomic data set. So we've done some benchmarking on that, and as I mentioned, MBC, which is that naive Bayes, naive Bayes classifier, which was actually produced back in 2007, the 2011 reference was a web-based form of that, actually performs the best, and it seems to be incredibly difficult to outcompete 
uh, NBC platform. Rob? So I like the abundance is not the same as expression because it sort of alludes to one of those awkward intrusions of biology and bioinformatics. Um, RNA, mRNA degrades at different rates depending on its sequence and its structure. How much of a problem is that bacteria? Different sort of mRNA half lives. So, we, going back to our stool sample, we tried to analyze this by looking at uh, 16 different ways of preparing um, the RNA and storing the RNA. So we stored it at 4 degrees and uh, I think minus 20 and then we processed immediately or we left it for a week and then we added RNA later or we didn't add RNA later. Unfortunately, when we performed that experiment, we ended up with 95% host reads because the sample we got was from an individual who was suffering um, IBD. And what was interesting to us was this seems to be an incredibly high amount of host mRNA that we were getting out from the stool sample, given what other people have been reporting. Turns out that uh, colleagues in Ottawa had also found similar results from IBD patients and stool samples of IBD patients that there seems to be a large amount of host material in their stool samples relative to bacterial samples. So we weren't able to follow through and see what the different impact of the degradation was. That was exactly what we wanted to do. But actually, that's, that's my question is a little bit different in that the mRNA transfers from different genes can have different half-lives, right? So the fucose kinase gene might produce an mRNA 15 minutes on average, whereas uh, polyphosphate kinase can produce an mRNA. And that's, that's an important part of regulation. I mean, you carry it, so, but I don't know the story in uh, bacteria. Is that something people have to consider? Ah, uh, pass. <laughs> so potentially that's why people are maybe moving on to the metaproteomics in order to get around that whole relationship between the number of messenger RNAs that you can predict and the actual proteins that are actually annotated. So this is absolutely right. There's a number of confounding factors that the gene expression profiles that you get out aren't necessarily reflective of what the actual protein abundance is, but Jack's probably going to correct me on this. No, I'm not correcting you. I just think you're pushing the problem forward. I mean, if you have a protein, you don't know if it's modified in a way that it will act in the effect it's of the phenotype. You know, you can be PT antigen or cost, translation and modification, and the likes as well. I mean, it's not very satisfying. I'm not blaming you for anything. But it, it's, it's, just, it's just a lot of work to do that. I guess. But, um, no, I guess if it wasn't stool, right? Like if this was something that snapped rather than right through time, then maybe that's not as much an issue. And then at least you don't have to have our negative rotation, what would obviously be doing stool all the time. They didn't just pick a non human thing, like go in the soil or something, and snap freezes. So obviously, you will get our turn turnover at different rates, but that's kind of a point of that you realize you're taking a snapshot. Has anybody here has anybody here looked at, looked at what protocols they're using for RNA storage and processing? Uh. Well, the DNA Genotech has a stool processing sample where they state that RNA is a lot stable in there. Um, and they have some data, uh, one paper from a group that's independent from the company. Uh, but, you know, in the old days, we used the uh, 20 GMIs or thiocyanate to kind of be the only one that seemed to work. So the, so, so the one issue I'd have with that is how do you know what kind of biases you're going to be getting out unless you start comparing and doing that benchmarking? So again, it's, it's potentially the same as with the 16S where you really need more rigorous benchmarking of all these different kits across standard samples that we can say what are the best ways that we're handling these kinds of samples. And back to Morgan's kind of point that why don't we just snap freeze these things? We find that even when we store these samples in minus 80, by the time we get around to actually sequencing them about even six months or a year later, 
you can get degradation. So there seems to be issues with any long-term storage of these particular molecules. And it doesn't make any sense to me. If you put something at minus 80, why is it still deteriorating? But that seems to be our experience at the moment. Was there another question? Yes. Yes, it's more of a so the idea with doing mental transcriptomics is to look at the active and transcribing bacteria as opposed to the bacteria which might be dormant or less than in the well environment. So, uh, so does that, so you've said that mRNA expression is not equivalent to RNA abundance, and that's a good thing because initially it seems to be surprising, but we want it to be that way. Oh, I, so I do apologize if I, if I did suggest that that was a bad thing. Again, absolutely. Abundance is not the same as expression, okay? So, I, exactly right. Um, we, we do actually want to see what the expression is, and we're not expecting things to be the same as the ribosomal RNA profiles. Sorry if I was a uh, little confusing with that. Yes? Uh, yeah. I'm not quite uh, over here, but uh, I would assume that, uh, you know, when you do the, the processing of the RNA, there's a... Uh, step where you do normalization. At which, at which point? Uh, maybe we can do the library. So, uh, yeah, so this is where the RPKM okay. value comes in. So you're normalizing for how many reads have been generated in total for that particular sample. And you're also normalizing for the length as well. So that's the normalization step. I think that's the only normalization step that is actually going into this analysis. Okay, so uh, 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 how can you account for the uh, degradation of the transcript? The degradation? Yeah. We can't. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> and was there another oh, um, comment This behind? goes back to the RNA, RNA storage. I just pulled out my labs protocol, and for stool samples, we do keep it minus 80, but we also use RNA protect. Right. I don't know if you've had any luck or bad luck. Again, I, I wouldn't be tempted to use it, but I'd love to hear what the difference is between adding that and not adding it, and the types of reads that you're getting out at the end of it, if it does actually make any difference. Again, it's one of those studies that need to be done. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, did you mention this yesterday about the 16S study, where they looked at all these different sample kits and all these different pipelines? And this was, I think this is about to be published in Nature Biotech. It's about three years old, so it's all a little bit worthless because everything's moved on since then. But these are the kinds of studies that we need, these kinds of benchmarking, we're using these kinds of standard samples to see what works and what doesn't work. Absolutely. Any, any further questions, comments? All right. Good. So we've generated our messenger RNA, we've sequenced it, we've annotated it, we've assembled it, we've done some functional annotation, we've done some taxonomic annotations, so now how do we actually visualize these results? So we could start looking at things like taxonomy uh, within our data set. So there's this nice tool called Krona, and Keiju, as I mentioned, it features a nice script that converts its output into a format that's usable by Krona. So this is a tool that you'll be using during the uh, tutorial, and you can click and select these different groups and it kind of expands and it's quite cool and whatever. I'm not sure you'd actually present anything like this in your paper, but it's kind of, this is the payoff. You spent all of this time generating these data sets. I want to look at it, and then this is kind of a nice, cool kind of payoff at the end. Uh, this is something interesting I came across recently, Visbin. Um, so this performs a dimension reduction, a dimension reductionality, kind of like a, a PCA. Uh, to generate clusters of reads based on their KMA distributions. And the idea is that each of these clusters here might represent sets of reads that are coming from a similar, from the same organism. So this could help to, for example, uh, maybe guide binning prior to assembly. And it, it, I don't know, it looks kind of cool and it gives you a kind of an overview of what your um, sample might look like in terms of its KMA distributions. So that's kind of a cool tool. In terms of function, um, I don't know how many of you are reading these metagenomic papers. It's not quite so bad now, but maybe about three, four years ago, 
most of the functional annotations or the functional analyses that you got back were either just lists or groups of keg pathways that are up, down, regulated, or these very simple bar charts here that might be based on things like gene ontology or COG annotations. So these don't tend to be very informative. I don't think that they're particularly interesting. And uh, part of the problem is that the categories are very broad. So there's been more interest in kind of um, placing genes into the context of the systems in which they're operating. So we know that genes don't operate in isolation. They're actually part of these highly complex pathways or complexes that are performing some common function. So we can think about placing our data sets in the context of for example, protein complexes, metabolic pathways, or even signaling networks. And so if we can start placing our metatranscriptomic reads in these contexts, we might get a better idea as to what are the functions that are really being coordinately um, upregulated or downregulated in, in these particular samples. Um, so these were two tools that we mentioned yesterday, MG RAST and Megan. So these feature these kinds of keg-like pathways that you can layer on your metagenomic, metatranscriptomic data sets. Um, metabolic pathways are very good because they're very highly conserved. We know a lot about them. We know what the organization of the pathways should look like. Thanks very much to Keg. So these give us a quite intuitive way of uh, understanding how reads and uh, transcripts might be mapping and expression might be mapping in the context of these pathways. One issue I have with these though is that these present pathways in isolation. They don't show connections across and between pathways. So we know that some of these enzymes here are producing substrates that might be utilized by another pathway somewhere else. You can't see that through these kinds of simple pathway-based analyses. And so we prefer to um, take more of a network-based approach. So part of the reason for this, if we, if we go back to these metabolic pathways, keg-defined metabolic pathways, the way that these were annotated and curated in the first place is they were largely based either on E. coli data, yeast data, or human data. And so we're dealing with these microbiomes, which have all these different bacteria in there, which can have all these other different pathways that may not be captured through these particular standardized keg pathways. So we regenerate these kinds of global metabolic networks, if you like, and then you can start layering on um, your uh, metatranscriptomic data. So here we can combine taxonomic and functional annotations. So these are different enzymes that we've identified in a particular metatranscriptome. And then these pie charts represent the breakdown or the contribution of each of the different taxa that we have that is contributing that particular function within this particular pathway. Okay, so this really gives us an idea of what genes, what enzymes, what pathways are being upregulated in that particular sample, and what are the taxa that are actually responsible for doing that upregulation. Um, Another type of network that we can use, a type of network, is are these protein interaction networks. So these offer additional scaffolds that we can also use to interpret our metatranscriptomic, meta potentially metagenomic data sets as well. So this is a, um, a protein interaction network of genes involved in cell wall biogenesis. And this is, we've mapped on contributions from a mouse gut microbiome. So we can see that these three genes here uh, there's a large contribution from this purple tax, which I think are bacteroides. So maybe bacteroides are producing a lot of these um, mule C, mule G, mule E genes, and the levels of peptidoglycan associ associated with those uh, particular enzymes. One issue with these kinds of data sets is that these rely on the fact that somebody's generated these protein interaction networks in the first place. These are pretty limited to only a few taxa, or at least the high confidence ones are. There are functional networks that you can get from the string database, which captures a whole bunch of different taxa, but they're not particularly high quality. Um, the high quality ones are really limited just to a few taxa, such as E. coli. So now you're reliant on homology mapping. You have to map your transcript from organism X onto an E. coli gene in order to be able to create these kinds of views. OK, so that's visualization. What about statistical considerations? Again, metatranscriptomics lagging behind metagenomics, lagging behind uh, 16S data sets. There's really no dedicated software or statistical tool for doing comparisons of metatranscriptomic data sets. So we're really reliant on existing tools for RNA-seq data sets. Number of biological replicates, as I mentioned, we need at least two, preferably at least three. But these are expensive experiments. So this is really reducing people's options in terms of how many biological replicates and what kind of questions 
attenuated form. Power analyses, again, no idea how we're doing those at the moment. One thing we can start doing are applying these um, kind of RNA-seq-like tools, so DEC2, ALDEX2, to identify differential expression of individual genes. If we can identify genes that are differentially expressed, then we can do these kinds of gene cell enrichment analyses. But I think ultimately, given the problems that we have in the statistics and the lack of power that we have with uh, these kinds of data sets, lack of replicates, we should really be viewing these metatranscriptomics experiments more as hypothesis generation um, that we should be following up with, as, as someone mentioned earlier, with these qPCR kind of experiments to actually verify in a larger kind of selling large number of biological replicates that what you're seeing really is true. Um, just to show you the kinds of analyses that you can do, again, you can do PCA plots. So this is for our 16 mice uh, guts uh, that we did earlier, Plinto versus wild type, high fat versus low fat. And we find with these PCA plots, um, this is tax, so there's no differentiation between the green and the red. Here we see significant differences between the green and the red. The red are the Plinto mice fed a high fat diet. The green are the wild type mice fed a high fat diet. We see a similar um, shift as well, a significant variation between uh, Plin2 and wild type high fat mice, um, mice fed a high fat diet, and also under pathways as well. So through this kind of plot, we're starting to see that while there are no differences at the taxonomic level, there are differences at the transcripts, enzymes, and pathway levels. So there are significant functional differences between these two different sample types. Then we can use uh, DEC2, ALDEX2, uh, these kinds of differential expression, um, gene expression uh, tools, uh, to identify these genes, which we can then put into genes and enrichment analyses. So we can perform hypergeometric tests. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, under a high fat diet, the PLIN2 mouse, the wild type mice, you can identify 22 keg pathways that are enriched in these differentially expressed genes. Then once you can identify these particular pathways, so glycolysis, gluconeogenesis, then you can go back to your visualization and see what does this actually mean. And I think I kind of like this as a, as a way of kind of convincing you guys, I hope, in terms of can we actually get something meaningful out of these kind of studies or is it just all noise? And what was nice from doing this study is you'll see these large sets of these consecutive enzymes, so these are performing consecutive reactions in the glycolysis pathway, these are all downregulated in the PLIN2 mouse relative to the high fat mouse. So there appears to be a coordinated uh, differential expression downregulation of these enzymes in the PLIN2 mouse. And again, we think that this is potentially due to accumulation of triglycerides. If you have a lot of triglycerides, energy isn't such an issue you need to start changing flux within your energy production pathways to producing biomass instead. You've got sufficient energy, produce more biomass, you can grow quicker. And I think that's it. So I'm happy to take any final comments, questions. Who's interested in doing metatranscriptomics now? Yes, awesome. Yes. Metatranscriptomics, I'm interested in how could you use these tools if you want to look at, let's say, pathogen inside of a host and its transcripts, um, and maybe also the host um, RNA, but only focus really on one of the whole microbiome, and would you use those same tools? And is there, for this application, any way to be more specific and to not have all this background of the other microbes? Or let's say you want to look at the Cultures. That or maybe maybe one idea would be to use microarrays instead. Microarrays instead. Yeah. But how do you get the RNA? That's my problem. I guess how do you get the RNA enriched? Let's say I have a stool sample and I want to get the RNA from a specific pathogen to see what it's doing in the whole. I think with microarray you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily care because if you design the chip carefully enough the hybridization should only occur between the transcripts that you have in your pathogen relative to all of the other transcripts that are in there. So that would be one advantage of microarrays compared right, so with RNA-seq. 
but presumably you know what the pathogen is, so it's relatively trivial to sequence that now and to construct a microarray on the basis of that. Exactly. Yeah. Just, uh, I read a paper on Campylobacter and that was what the authors did is actually IP the, R uh, the RNA after, uh, to, uh, after, right after the gut, and then after that they use a Luminex platform to, to analyze. But it, it was very messy. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I heard. And another way to do that would be to like target capture. They synthesize all these sequences on bees for you to fish up. Uh, the genome or the pan genome or whatever it is. In. This is pretty expensive. If you need to take it. Or single cell genomics. That's very trendy at the moment. All right, so I'm going to. Yep, thank you very much. Uh, there's also flow cytometry. There's, uh, you can actually, if you make an antibody against it, you can fish out. The, the bug from the stool, literally. Uh, the people who run the full cytometry facility may not like you much, but uh, that's feasible. And there's other ways uh, also that can that can be done. Yeah. All right.